Have your way, God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you tonight. Pray that God will bless us with what he wants done tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. Keep praying, keep believing that God will move the barriers in your life, in your family, friends, all over the place. Amen? I'm going to teach you on something I don't think I've really taught on here before. Tithing. Now, everybody does it, but they don't really know what. Sometimes they don't know what it's all about. There's so much controversy today, in the, especially in the evangelical circles, not so much in Pentecostal, but in the evangelical circles. Uh, is it for today? Is it not for today? Uh, blah, 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 blah. But there's a proven powerful principle in tithing. Amen. And so uh, we're going to open up our Bibles tonight, and we're going to see what the Lord has to say. Father, we thank you and we praise you, God, and we ask you, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit to teach us and show us what tithing is all about. And, Father, that it is a proven principle that, Father, that you do great things for those who would obey your word and so, Father, we give you thanks, and we praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. There are two things that are certain in life, death and taxes. Okay, that's the truth. And uh, I want to just share this little story before I get into this. I wasn't going to do it, but I'm going to do it. Um, this couple um, was very uh, eccentric, and they had a uh, dinner set with the silverware and everything that was handed down to a um, few generations worth lots and lots of money. And so uh, one Sunday, they invited the pastor over for dinner, him and his wife, and they came over for dinner. It was a wonderful dinner, and she took out all this special silverware and, you know, place settings and crystal glasses and crystal bowls, and it was just a wonderful time of feasting. And, and just the silverware alone, the, the, it was a little teaspoon, really small spoon for the sugar, just that spoon was about $400, very costly. So the pastor and his wife, they left, and the next morning she had gotten up to clean everything, make sure you know, everything that was in the dishwasher, and she was looking for that little spoon. She could not find that little spoon. And she said to her husband, you know what, honey? He says, I hate to say this, and I don't want to bring accusation, but I believe that the pastor stole our spoon. It's been missing. And so she let it go for a few weeks, and then weeks turned into months, and then months turned into almost a year. And finally, she just couldn't take it anymore. And she went to the pastor, and she said, Pastor, I've got to talk to you, she says. 
uh, this has been bothering me. How many know that sometimes people let things fester too long? You know, Pastor, this has been bothering me. You know, we had you over for dinner almost a year ago, and I had this little silver, this little, uh, silver spoon that was handed down from generation to generation. It was worth about $400. And I saw you were the last one using it, and we can't find that spoon. So I want to just come out and ask your pastor, did you take that spoon? And he said, yes, I did. She says, do you know where it is? He said, yes. She said, where? He says, I put it in your Bible. So you know what that meant. She hadn't been reading her Bible. Praise the Lord. Let's look at Romans chapter 13, verse 1. And then verse 5 to 7, 13 verse 1. It says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Verse 5 to 7. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. Verse 6. For this cause, pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Verse 7. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to fear, honor to whom honor. In Mark chapter 12, verse 13 to 17. And while he's turning there, I just want to say this about Romans. This is about rendering submission to authority. Rendering submission to authority. I, I find that in the, in the days that we live in today, that not too many people want to surrender or want to obey authority in their life. You see it with the police. You see it. You know, in church, you see it with pastors. I'm not talking about the abusive pastors that are abusing their authority. But I'm talking about those who have authority. But the word we just read says for us to give tribute to a tribute, pay taxes, as much as we hate taxes, but we pay taxes. Give tribute to whom tribute is due. But also to do it because we're under authority. You know, I think it started back in the 60s. You might remember that. Remember the afros and the platform shoes and the bell bottoms and all that. And the, and the thing was, do your own thing. Do your own thing. Don't worry about everybody. Just do your own thing. Don't, don't mind. Just do your own thing. And it was a spirit of rebellion that was kicked out in the 60s and just swept this nation. So, I believe the number one problem, and you can adjust this to many facets of God's word, and whether we're obedient or not to God's word, is because we don't like to submit to authority. Some of you, when you work out in the work field, you have bosses. There's the military. They have offices over them. Or if you're an office manager and you manage in a, uh, in a business, you know how difficult and how frustrating it can be when you try to get people to do something and they will not comply or they do not believe in your leadership. It all stems from a lack of respect for authority. In Mark chapter 12, verse 13 to 17,
It says this, and they sent unto him, uh, and they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when they were come, they say to him, Master, we know that thou art true, and carest for no man. They're setting him up. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Well, I wish they would really believe that. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? What they were actually trying to get Jesus to do was to come against authority. Remember they asked him, they said, Lord, when is it you're going to restore, you know, our freedom to Israel again? And he says, not for you to know the times or seasons, but it's in my Father's hands. They wanted, they wanted a national restoration under the hands of the Roman Empire. God said, no. No. How many believe that God raises up kings and puts down kings? And if you believe that, then you can believe that God can raise up Donald Trump. But there are some Christians that really fight that. They're fighting, they're, they're, they're actually hoping for his destruction. Christians. And that's a sad thing. Because what they don't understand is that God lifts up kings and he puts down kings and, he, and, and even bad kings. Read your Bible. So it's a matter of the bottom line is the matter of submitting to authority, number one. So he says, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? And he says here, shall we give or shall we not give? Shall we give or not give? Now, they already knew the penalty for not giving their taxes. I can tell you right now, if you go a couple of years without paying your taxes, you are going to pay the fiddler. Something's going to happen. They're going to come after you. You don't pay your house taxes. What's going to happen? They'll foreclose on you. You don't pay your excise tax on your car, guess what? When it comes time for registration and renewal of your license, you're not going to get it done. So he says, but he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, why tempt ye me? Why are you tempting me with this question? He says, bring me a penny that I may see it. Now, I'm sure he saw, he, know, he knows what's on a penny. But he was doing that for an illustration to them. And then they, he, they it says, uh, and they brought it, and he said unto them, Who is this image and subscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. Verse 17. Jesus answered, said unto them, Render to Caesar. Listen to that now. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Exodus 19.5. Keep, keep your finger in Mark 12.17. He says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me. Is that the one that I want? Let me see. 19.5. That's it, right? 
Now, therefore, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth, say it with me, all the earth is mine. Now, how many of us really believe that? I got no hands. I got one little hand. I got two hands back there. You got two hands over there. Do you really believe that all the earth is his? All of it? It all belongs to God. So then, going back to Mark, and he says, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. How do we render to God when he already owns it? So he has something particular here in mind. He's got the inscription, money. It has to do with money. And he's saying, rent it to Caesar, give what belongs to Caesar, but also give what belongs to God. Now, all the earth is the Lord's. So what is it that God is telling us to give him? It's not an offering. Not what he's talking about. He's talking about rendering, giving back. Hello? Do you think that's your, all your money you earned at work all week? No. Whatever service you provide, whatever you do, whatever product you make, it came from the resources of the earth. The Bible says the gold is his and the silver is his. Now, money cannot be made without a gold backing. Although Obama tried to do that. <laughs> Printed all that money with no gold backing. That's why the, the deflation of the dollar went down. But the Bible says the gold and the silver is his. Look at Deuteronomy, four, uh, Deuteronomy 10, 14. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God. The earth also, with all that therein is. Think about that. Everything belongs to God. Remember what I told you when we first started out? We, we were talking about authority and respecting authority and being under authority. Well, when Satan rebelled, he rebelled against authority. And when he fell, when pride was found in him and he fell and he was cast out of heaven, he came here to usurp authority. Now, what happens is that when we don't recognize that God owns everything, and we think that we owned everything. We're of the same spirit. Hello? Everything. Doesn't it say that? The earth also with all that therein is. All of the resources God Owns it.
Do you know that he gives you the 90% back? God's not greedy. He lets you stew it, if you will, 90%. Of what you produce. That's fair. Don't you think that's fair? Amen. All there that they're in is his. Job forty one verse eleven. Some of the Wheels might be turning. Well, we'll pause for the Old Testament. Amen, it is. Still inspired. Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is... Mine. Here we have God saying, whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. He takes divine ownership of it. That's why if you own anything, you better thank God that he's let you use it for a while. Because, you know, sometimes we think we own things, and we really don't. Oh, I own my own house. No, you don't. The bank does it. Until you pay it off, then you can own it. You have co-ownership. You have an automobile, you have a loan. You don't own that automobile. That bank has a lien on that. Hello? Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Look at Haggai for a moment. Chapter 2, verse 8. Okay? The silver is mine. And the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Think about it. It all belongs to God. The word tithe in sixteen eleven is a tenth. That's what the word tithe means, a tenth. In Leviticus, oh, let me, let me back up for a moment. Now let's, let's look at the New Testament and we're going to go back to the Old Testament. I want to do that first. Let's look at what Christ said about tithing. You know Christ mentioned tithing? How many know that? 
Did you know that he mentioned it? Matthew 23. Starting at verse 23. He said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Boy, he was not a very loving Jesus back then, you know. You know, if Jesus was alive today, we'd have to send him for a, you know, personality, um, some kind of adjustments, you know, maybe some personal anger management classes or something, you know. You know, um, maybe he needed to uh, understand, you know, that uh, the language that he's using here is very hurtful and very painful to people's psyche and emotions. You know, he needs to be a little more sensitive, you know, to people's feelings and emotions and, you know. Hypocrite! <laughs> I don't think he said hypocrite. He said, you're hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and you've omitted the weightier matters of law, judgment, and mercy, and faith. He says, these ought ye to have done. Wait a minute, what were they not doing? They weren't executing law, the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. They weren't doing that, right? But they were doing something else. What were they doing? They were tithing a tenth of all that they had. Then Jesus said this, and not to leave the other undone. So he switches from the judgment, mercy, faith, and law and he goes back to their paying the tithe, the tenth of mint, anise, and cumin. And he says, and you're not to leave the other undone. That's what he's talking about. He's telling them, you, 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 you do the love. You, you, you're, not, you're missing the judgment, mercy, and faith. So you need to do that, but you're not, you also need to not leave the other undone. Don't just look at law, uh, you know, judgment, mercy, and faith and then stop doing the tithe. No. You continue doing what you're doing. Hello? A lot of people think that they pay their tithe. It's not a payment. And second of all, it's not yours. Now remember when we first started the study tonight, I shared with you about it's about authority. Believing God's words and having God's word as your final authority. Knowing God's word and having him as your final authority. But the tithe, and I hear this all the time and it drives me crazy. Oh, I can't afford to pay my tithes. I'm sure you've heard that talking to someone. I can't afford to pay my tithes. Well, let's look at that sentence for a moment. I can't. Okay, let's render that to the proper English. I won't. That's what it really is. It's not I can't. Because you're not... Submitted to the authority of God's word. I won't pay my tithe. I can't afford 
to tithe. When somebody tells me that I can't afford to tithe, you know what I say to them? I said, have you been tithing? And they go, no. I said, well, that's why you can't afford it. If I was to ask you, How God has blessed you in your giving him and submitting to his ownership and allowing his authority to rule your life in saying, I'm going to pay the tithe that God requires. How many would say that they've been blessed? I cannot begin to tell you how God has blessed Linda and I in powerful ways, financially. I mean, it wasn't too long ago Linda and I were living in someone's basement. We didn't have a home of our own. Hello? It wasn't too long ago that we had to pray in our food. We had to pray. Linda would pray in clothes for her self. Hello? Well, did you tithe back then? Yes, we did. But how many know sometimes you don't reap right at that moment? You're setting up. Sometimes a spiritual 401k. For God to bless you. The Bible says that the tithe belongs to him. Look at Leviticus chapter 27 verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, belongs to the farmer. Is that what it says? Who does it belong to? Even in its seed form, they were tithing, they were giving that tenth of all of their increase. Why? Because they came to the conclusion that God's authority in their life was more important for them to be obedient to than to see the repercussions of what they would go through by being disobedient. Hello? Verse 32. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock, even whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. Say these words with me. The tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. Now, that which is holy has to be consecrated, that which is holy has to be separated. So the tithe of the herd or the flock or the seed or whatever it was belonged to the Lord and it was considered to be holy unto the Lord. We 
must be obedient to his authority in order to experience the blessing of his holiness in our life. When we come into alignment with the principles of God's word and submit, that's a word people don't like, but, but submit to his authority, there is tremendous blessing. We've already seen what the enemy, Satan, Lucifer, what his reward was by disobedience. We saw Adam and Eve's repercussions of their disobedience. What was, what was their repercussion, Adam and Eve? Got kicked out of the garden, yeah. But they were cursed. Deuteronomy says, choose between this day cursing and blessing. What does that mean? Whether you submit to his authority or you won't submit to his authority. Either you submit to God's word, that's his authority, or you won't submit to God's word, that's his authority. And when you rebel, come on, the Bible says Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. All of the tithe belongs to God. Abraham and Jacob paid tithes. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Melchizedek came 400 years before the law. So people will say, well, tithing is under the law. No, it's not. Proverbs says, bless the Lord with the first fruits of all thy increase. I believe it's Proverbs. Who was Melchizedek in the Old Testament? He had no mother. He had no father. Who was he? Who was Abraham paying tithes to? Who was Melchizedek? Well, if he had no mother, no father, that means he had no beginning and no end. And there's only one alpha. There's only one alpha, one omega. Come on, somebody, get this. Get this in your spirit. I believe it was what's called a Christophany. Abraham was paying tithe to Christ. Hello. Look at Genesis 14, verse 19. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Verse 20. And blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him, God, a tenth of all. Why did he do that? Why did Abraham, go back to verse 19 again. I want to read that again. Listen to this. 
And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Again, establishing divine ownership. And then verse 20, again he says, And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. You see the connection? And he gave him a tenth of all. You can't buy God. Some people say, well, that's like buying God's fit. You can't. No, 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 no. First of all, it's not yours to give or to buy. He gave him the tenth of all. Why? Because why? Come on, somebody, you've got to get this, man. Why did he give him that tenth? Because the tenth is holy. Get that in your spirit. Get that in your spirit. I'm going to tell you something. From the first time I got saved, okay, the first church service I went to, people were given, and I, I just gave, you know, and then people started telling me about tithing. I said, what's that? And they, they explained it to me. I said, okay, no problem. I've never had a problem all of my Christian life. And sometimes I only had a quarter to tithe. Sometimes I only had change. And, you know, you feel embarrassed, but you throw it in the thing, and it goes clang, 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 clang. But whatever you get, whatever thine increase, whatever it is, you get an unexpected check, tithe. All thy increase. All. Why? Because the tithe is holy. Come on, somebody now. Let's look for a moment in Malachi chapter 3. I love this. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Uh, wait a minute. Let me. Let me. I'm gonna look. I want. I want to see something. I want to see how far I can go back. Let's go to verse six. Let's go to verse six. For I am. When you see that phrase, for I am the Lord, what's he doing here? Huh? Yes, he's establishing his authority. Why do you pull over when you see the lights light up and a state trooper pulls you over? Why? Why not just keep going? Huh? Why? Because he has the authority. And you're submitting to that authority and you're pulling over. But if you just shrug it off and say, you know what, I'm just going to keep on going. What do you think is going to happen to you? You're going to pay the consequence. Here, when you read this stuff, this should, this should cause you to tremble at God's word. I am, for I am the Lord. When you read that, go, oh, oh, something's coming. He's establishing something. He's establishing his authority. Now, Lord, how do I line up to what you want now? 
He says, for I am the Lord. I change not. That way you can put your confidence in who he is. He's not a flip-flopper. He doesn't go back one minute, forward another minute, back one minute, forward another. No, 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 no. He is consistent to who he is. And that way you can depend on him. You can trust him. Come on, I'm building up here. I'm building us up to something. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Verse 7. See, very seldom do we read the verses before. Okay. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinances. You have not kept them. And he says, return unto me, and I will return unto you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, wherein shall we return? They didn't know what their departure from God was. They were asking him, God, you know, God, what are you talking about? Uh, you know, how, wherein shall we return? You're asking us to return so that you can return back to us. But, but where, 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 where shall we return? Now, verse 8. Will a man rob God? What caused God to turn away from them? They turned away from their ordinances. They turned away. Listen now. This is the most important. They turned away from the establishment of God's authority in their life. I'm telling you, this is powerful. They turned away from the establishment of God's authority in their life. And God says, when you turn away from me I'll, and my authority, I'm going to turn away from you. Whatsoever a man will sow, that shall he also reap. Will a man rob God? Why did God just come out and say that? Now we got a prophet here that's speaking this. He's telling them the message that they need to hear, but they may not like it. I tell people God's word, and I, read, I just read God's word. They get mad at me. I tell them, don't get mad at me. I'm reading the word. If the Bible says this is going to happen to you, it's going to happen to you, not because I want it to. He said, will a man rob God? God speaking through this prophet, Malachi. Wow. He's speaking through this prophet. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. What in the world is he talking about? But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? God, how did we rob you? You're calling us a thief, God. What is a thief? What is a robber? What is a thief? It is someone who illegitimately takes something that doesn't belong to them. Am I right? Isn't that what it is? That's what a thief is. It's someone who illegitimately takes something that doesn't belong to them. He says, 
Wherein have we robbed you? God, how have we done that? He said, in tithes. That's bad enough. That's bad enough. God could have stopped right there. You have taken and robbed. You have taken illegitimately taken something that doesn't belong to you, that is set aside, that is holy, that belongs to me, and you have robbed me. Ooh. Ouch. Not only tithes, but offerings. You can rob God of offerings. But you know what? The real person who suffers there is you. Because the, Jesus said these words. He says, if you give, men shall give back unto you, into your bosom, pressed down, shaken together, running over. But see, there are two kinds of people. There are givers and there are takers. And the takers are never givers. They always want, 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 need, need, need. And the reason why they're takers is because they can't trust God and submit to his authority and give legitimately what belongs to God that they took illegitimately. They're thieves. They're robbers. I ain't calling you that. That's what the word says. Don't get mad at me. I'm, t I'm teaching you tonight, and I'm telling you on, on Facebook how you can get out of the dilemma you're in and get financially blessed. You have robbed me in tithes and offerings. Hey, I got this large sum of money, you know. Did you tithe? Nope. Guess what? You're robbing God. And that money will be chewed away. Like the Pac-Man. Come on. Now, how many know that whenever you have The authority of God, the establishment of God, that there is a it's the word I'm trying to find, consequence for doing the opposite of what God requires. Come on, somebody. If you refuse to submit to that authority, I, I know it's getting a little bit late, but just give me another 15 minutes, I promise. I'll try to finish this up because this is good stuff. If you refuse to submit to that authority, think about this now. You submit to God's authority, you get what? Blessed. Abraham was blessed, right? And he gave a tenth of all that he had. He was blessed. God blessed him. He, he gave God what belonged to God. And he was blessed even more. And he got blessed even more. He kept giving back to God. Hallelujah. There was a man that I was reading about. He started a business and he started tithing his business. And before you know it, after a few years, his business was so successful, he was tithing 50% of his business. He was making so much money. But how many know that when you submit like Abraham would to the authority of God, that you begin to be blessed, but if you don't submit to the authority of God's word, and you just think it's a Bible, it's just a book, just a bunch of words, guess what? Verse 9 is your dilemma. You... Ah, 
cursed with a curse. You have robbed me, even this whole nation. Can I tell you, without people honoring God and giving their tithes, this ministry could not exist. Well, I don't believe that, Pastor. I believe there's other churches that they don't believe in tithing and they got big ministries. Yeah, and guess what? They're selling buildings off left and right because they can't afford them anymore. You, you know, <laughs> that's not a proof. God will always show his word true. Always. I don't care how many buildings somebody has. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Verse 10. He says, bring ye all. Say all. Not some. Not a portion of it. Well, I can't afford to tithe this week, so I'm only going to give $5. No. Thief, you're robbing God again. Setting yourself up for a curse. Setting yourself up for, uh, uh, you know, because you're not giving yourself to God's authority. I want to be blessed. I don't want to take what doesn't belong to me. How would you like it if somebody came to your house and just walked in one day and said, Hey, how you doing, Rebecca? How you doing, Bobby? And took your TV right off the wall and, took it and put it in the truck and went away. You'd you be going, hey, 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 that doesn't belong to you, you thief. That's what God does to you. You thief, you're cursed. He said, bring ye all, bring ye all your tithe, right? Huh? It doesn't say bring your tithe. Because it don't belong to you. It is not your tithe. I, 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 it drives me crazy when I hear, even on, on, on uh, uh, the internet, you don't pay your tithe. It ain't yours. It don't belong to you. Bring all the, definite article, the tithe. What's the tithe? That which belongs to God. Into the storehouse. That there, there might be meat in my house. I'm sorry. I can't help people that don't tithe. They come to church. They don't give money, you know, give their tithe to God. They're not in obedience to, to God. They're, you know, they're cursed. And... They're not submitting to the authority of God, and then they want to they mon take money from the church? No. I can't do that. I'd be a bad steward to do that. Doesn't mean I don't love the person, don't care about the person. But guess what? You know, Jesus said, let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay. And there's some times that you can say no. But if it's in your power to meet the need, I suggest you do it. He says, listen, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. Don't bring a part of it this week and a part of it next week. Bring it all. I had one person say this to me, you know, you know uh, well, um, Pastor, this is years ago. Pastor, I'm not going to be in church for two weeks. I'm going on vacation, so I'm not paying my tithe. I'm not going to be there. So I said, uh, well, are you going to go to your landlord and tell him that you're not going to be uh, in the apartment for two weeks and not give him two weeks' rent? Hello? Hello? People ain't going to do that. 
You, ain't, you know what your land is going to say? That's, t- that's your tough luck. You decide to go on vacation. You got, I, you got all your stuff here. This is still your apartment. You, this is still rented. You got to pay your rent. He said, bring all the tithes, the tithes, plural, into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And then God says this, prove me. Prove me. I could tell you families in this church, it was tough to tithe. It was hard to tithe. But you look at their annual income today. Come on. Some of you are only making maybe $100, $200 a week. You are struggling. You are going through some hard times. And God opened up the way where there was no way, and you got a good job, and you started making more money than you ever made in your life. Come on, somebody. He said, prove me now, herewith, right now, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open to you the windows of heaven, excuse me, and pour you out a blessing. This is what I'm trying to get to you tonight. I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm not trying to say you're a bad person. I'm not trying to say you're evil, but you are what you are. I can't change that. If you're not submitting yourself under the authority of God, then you you, you got some problems. He said, but prove me, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it now watch this now that's in the natural realm that's in the natural realm but God does something else verse 11 and I will rebuke the Devourer. Now, let me say this. Everybody thinks the devourer is the devil. Devourer isn't the devil. The devourer is the curse. How rebuke the devourer, that disobedience that you've done. Now you're being obedient. I'll reverse it. I'll rebuke it. Hallelujah. I'm going to turn it around now. Woo, come on, somebody. I'm going to turn that curse that you've placed yourself in because you chose to put yourself back under my authority. Look at that. He said, I'm going to rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And that curse will not destroy, that devourer will not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. What causes the destruction of the fruits of of the ground? No rain. God says, I'll bless you with the former rain. And the latter rain, those are harvest times. Those are harvest times. Come on, somebody. The the former rain and the latter rain. And the latter rain shall be greater than the former rain. Whoo, glory. Hallelujah. Neither will it destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither your vine shall cast her fruit before the time in the field. In other words, I'm going to put the alignment of everything in Focus to the time of harvest so that you will be blessed in due season. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I have I have another scripture. I'm gonna to try to get to if I can get to it real quick. I don't know if I can, but it's in First Corinthians, real quick. 
Let me see if I can find it. Come on, where are you? Uh, let's see. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 2. Starting with verse 19, I'm going to close with this. I could go on, but I'm telling you, I think we've got enough meat tonight to chew on. Now, therefore, let me, well, let me clarify this. Are we in the New Testament now? Okay, we're in the New Testament, right? Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but what? We're the saints of with the saints and of the household of God. Verse 20. And are built upon the foundation. Let me ask you a question. Can you erect a building without a foundation? Huh? Everything stems from the foundation. Right? And are built upon the foundation of the apostles. That's New Testament, right? Wait a minute. And prophets. So the foundation, there's the apostles and the prophets. Understand when this was written, there's no New Testament canon. So it must be talking about the Old Testament prophets. It must be talking about Malachi. Oh, it's not for today. It says it is. If the church, that's what he's talking about. They're built upon the foundation. He's talking about the church. Of the apostles and prophets, Christ being the chief cornerstone. He's talking about the kingdom of God, talking about the church of God. We as the church, his people. If we're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, then that means including Malachi. Are you blessed? A person who doesn't tithe is a person who's not submitted to the authority of God. And those who are not submitted to the authority of God, you are in big trouble. So I hope that kind of gave you some insight tonight on why we tithe. Okay, because it's not our tithe, it's his tithe. It's set apart as holy. It's consecrated. It's set apart. It's, it's God's. It belongs to him. And when you honor God with that, and you bless God back with that, as it says, then he says, I will open up the windows of heaven. I'll pour out a blessing that you can't contain it. Come on, somebody. I mentioned this to somebody the other day. There's a lot of people that are obedient, but with a wrong spirit. You can be obedient and have a wrong spirit. That's why God loves a cheerful giver. I didn't get a chance to go into Macedonia where Paul was talking to the church and it says, give according to your heart. That has nothing to do with the tithe. That had to do about a one-time gift that he was receiving from the Macedonian church, and these people were dirt poor. Because they were dirt poor, he says, you give according to your heart. Don't, don't think you have to give this amount or that amount. That has nothing to do with abolishing tithing at all. I was going to say something I forgot. It was one of those moments. Oh, I was saying to somebody, I said, you can be obedient, but have a wrong spirit. But the ideal is, if you are willing and obedient, you eat the good of the land. You can't have one without the other. You got to be willing. God, I'm willing. I'm willing to submit myself to yours. See, it's all about authority. I'm willing to.